Good morning and welcome to the 12th meeting of the Health and Sports Committee in 2018. Can I ask everyone in the room to please make sure that their mobile phones are uh, off or set to silent? And while uh, some may wish to use social, uh, uh, mobile devices for social media purposes, uh, please do not use it for recording or photography as that is done for us by parliamentary staff. Now, the first item on our agenda is our roundtable evidence session looking at the health implications of clean air. This is part of our inquiry into the wider preventative agenda. It's a timely session as there is a debate this afternoon in the Chamber uh, on the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee's Air Quality in Scotland inquiry. I know uh, some of our witnesses today will be uh, following that uh, with interest as members are, so this session will give a uh, useful health perspective on that issue. We did invite both uh, Edinburgh Health and Social Care Partnership and NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde to send representatives to attend this session, but unfortunately neither was able to do so, uh, which is regrettable. However, we have some excellent witnesses here today. Uh, what I will uh, do in the usual uh, way of roundtable sessions uh, is introduce myself. I'm Lewis MacDonald, uh, MSP for North East Scotland and convener of the committee. I'll then ask Ash to do the same and then if we can go around the table accordingly. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. My name is Ash Denham. I'm the MSP for Edinburgh Eastern and I'm the Deputy Convener. Good morning. My name is Jane Claire Judson and I'm the Chief Executive at Chest Heart and Stroke Scotland. Morning. I'm Miles Briggs. I'm Conservative MSP for Lothian and Party Spokesman on Health and Sport. Morning. I'm Sally Hall from the University of Stirling. I'm Professor of Public and Population Health there. Morning, everyone. I'm Alex Cole Hamilton, Lib Dem MSP for Edinburgh Western and Party's Health Spokesperson. Good morning, I'm Olivia Allen, Policy Officer from ASMA UK. Good morning, I'm Jenny Gorris, the SNP MSP from Mid Fife and Glen Rothes. Good morning, I'm Emma Harper, I'm South Scotland uh, Region MSP and I'm actually the convener of the Lung Health Cross Party Group. Good morning, my name is Dave Newby, I'm uh, BHF Chair of uh, Cardiovascular and Cardiology at the University of Edinburgh and have a long standing interest in cardiovascular effects of air pollution. Um, morning, Alison Johnston, MSP for Lothian. Morning, I'm Colin Ramsey from Health Protection Scotland. I'm a consultant epidemiologist in environmental public health. Good morning, Ivan McKee, uh, MSP for Glasgow Proven. Good morning, I'm Miranda Lowe. I'm a senior exposure and environmental scientist at the Institute of Occupational Medicine. Good morning, I'm Brian Little, the South of Scotland MSP and party spokesman on health education, lifestyle and sport. Good morning, Sandra White, uh, MSP for Glasgow Kelvin. Uh, good morning, Claire Shanks, Policy and Public Affairs Officer for British Lung Foundation Scotland. Good morning, my name is David Stewart, I'm a Labour MSP for Highlands and Islands Region. Thank you very much. We will move uh, in a moment to questions. The routine is as, as usual with parliamentary committees. I will invite colleagues to ask questions. Please feel free to indicate uh, that you wish to answer questions and answers through the chair, please. So uh, if we can start with David Stewart. Uh, good morning, colleagues. Uh, the European Court of Justice has been the guardian of air quality for almost 40 years, and currently eight uh, European countries are facing action for poor air quality um, taken by client Earth. W once we complete the Brexit process, who or what organisation will be the guardian uh, for environment in Scotland? Who would like to start with that large picture question? Yes, please, Claire. Um, uh, well, as an organisation, we're calling for a Clean Air Act that covers the whole of the UK, and it's because of this confusion as to where the power is going to sit. And the legislation at the moment is quite... Uh, there are many, many layers. You've got legislation from the European Union and Parliament, you've got DEFRA, you have Scottish Government, then you have local authorities. Um, and when we've spoken to different uh, decision makers, there's confusion as to where the power sits and, and, and who is responsible. Um, for example, interpretation of uh, air quality management and local air quality guidance is interpreted very differently across local authorities um, and how they interpret guidance like that. So that's why we think there should be a new piece of legislation that really brings it all together. That means that post-Brexit, there is much, much greater clarity for everyone. Is that a, a widely held view that, that we do need some additional legislation? Uh, if, if that is a widely held view, where should that legislation sit? Should that be legislation 
at Westminster should it be legislation in the devolved administration so it's appropriate to uh, have, or you have those involved taking a view on these matters. Yes, please. I think in general, in terms of um, air quality, we know that that's something that affects local communities in particular. So there's definitely something about wherever the legislation sits and whoever holds ultimate accountability, that there has to be accountability at a local level and also the resources to be able to make decisions to actually make the changes that happen. So we know that in Scotland, for example, in terms of looking at the areas we want to see low emissions, that hasn't happened. And sort of looking at the accountability for that and how it is we can speed that process up, I think, is really critical. So I think there is a discussion to be had as to whether the, the legislation is held at Westminster or indeed in the Scottish Parliament, and that really has to flow in terms of how it is that we can empower the people at a local level to be able to make the changes that they need to make. I think there's a secondary issue which is around um, the involvement of the private sector and industry in terms of air pollution um, and clean air, um, and how it is that that works in terms of um, wh whatever the devolved settlement may be. Um, I think there is still some question as to how Brexit will in fact um, impact on that. Um, there's quite a lot of detail behind that, um, and, and that might affect actually how it is that legislation will then pan out um, throughout the devolved administrations of the United Kingdom. David. I think it's a, a good point. And, um, what we do know about the current negotiations, and obviously there's lots of things that we don't know in terms of the current negotiations, is we do know that uh, the UK government is withdrawing from Euratom, which uh, governs medical isotopes, because of the ECJ, and also there's some doubt of whether the EU emissions trading scheme will continue, which is the point Jean Clare was making. And yes, of course, that could continue within uh, the UK, but the beauty about the current scheme is scale. And you need that scale of having the 28 to run that scheme correctly. And just before I come out, Camina, and I promise you I won't read this, I had a quick glance at leading cases of the European Court of Justice cases, and it went, an environment went to 80 pages. That's what's happened over the last 40 years. My worry is what's going to happen post-Brexit, because who's going to enforce environmental le legislation on air quality if we're not in the European Court of Justice? Indeed. I wonder, David Newby, do you have a view on these matters? Well, clearly, uh, I support the comments made by Mike Clare and, and, and Jane Clare. We need clarity, uh, and this is a, a, an important topic that we have to address. And uh, clearly, it has to be very clear guidance. And I think, you know, we need to get keep the momentum going. And there's a danger it could slip. Sally, how do you? Um, I, I think I, I agree very much with what's been said so far, and this is critical from the point of view of accountability and monitoring. If there is lax if it's not clear where lines of responsibility are, then actually it's very difficult to evaluate and monitor the impact of, of the policy and the legislation. Okay. Sandra. Sandra, I just wanted to touch on an area that Jane Clare had mentioned in regards to local communities, and that's absolutely crucial, I think. Uh, lots of local communities are not that au fait. Uh, obviously, and finding out about air quality and monitoring, some are and very, very well educated in regards to it. Uh, when you mentioned about the data, do you think that data should be collected via each community and fed into perhaps health boards or? Point in terms of some of the work that we've been doing and looking at how we empower local communities to actually have that information. The Clean Air Strategy did mention having um, an air quality sort of communications campaign as a public um, campaign, and that hasn't really come to fruition. Um, there's always issues with those types of campaigns, um, and I think they are best delivered in partnership with local communities and the third sector in terms of actually hitting the communities where um, they could most make the impact. In terms of data, yes, if you don't know what's happening in your own community, either as an individual or, or as a, an authority or organisation working there it's, it's very hard to make those decisions I think one of the key things that we're concerned about is, is children in schools um, and children who have asthma and sort of managing um, the air quality around those areas um, and, and actually having the data available to monitor and, and look at that um, and I'll just very quickly mention as well um, admissions to accident and emergency and I think having that data linked to then what's happening locally with around air quality and having a look at that in terms of COPD and particularly in the winter uh, which is a particular issue about 50% of admissions are COPD during the winter and um, through the front door of the NHS um, and, and taking that into account and joining that data up I think is, is uh, particularly important. I'd be looking to the new public health body in terms of uh, its work with ISD and making sure that data is available so that people can make those decisions locally. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, just to reiterate a lot of what Jean Claire said, this is something that the British Lung Foundation feels really strongly about as well. We're calling for a lot better monitoring around schools, care homes, hospitals, because the whole point is we're, we want to tackle air quality to protect people's health. And 
we know that the people who are most vulnerable are people who are older, who have pre-existing health conditions, people who are young. So if we're not monitoring those areas where those people are and, and deprived communities as well, then we're not getting the fullest picture possible. And I agree working with local communities um, um, down in England, we set up a Clean Air Parents Network, which is empowering local parents to engage through schools and through their with their local authorities in terms of looking at local measures that can be taken for local air quality issues. Um, and that's something that's been really popular. It's really empowered the local community to, to make those decisions and help and help come up with solutions. Thank you very much. Uh, Emma. It's a quick stop, actually, around monitoring, because when we are... We took evidence when I was on the Environment Committee, as was Dave Stewart. We began the air quality inquiry and we looked at how many monitors there were in Scotland and there was only 95. So, and we're talking about airports as well as ferry ports, maybe as well. So people living around airports and ferry ports has been exposed. So I guess my question would be, should we invest in more um, monitors that are either mobile or fixed so that we can tackle um, measuring the, the quality of the air, not just around schools, but other areas as well. Rolanda? I would second um, this call for more data because um, there is a lack of information about kind of the spatial distribution of pollutants. And I think, um, you know, a lot of the monitors may not measure a wider range of pollutants. And I think this kind of information would be useful. Um, and the other thing I would call for is also um, while mobile monitoring is useful, I think long-term monitoring um, at various sites is also something that's good because you can look at trends over time. And you know, looking in the short term, you don't always know whether there is a true um, decrease or increase in pollution because variables such as um, the weather can influence um, the air pollution concentrations. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Sally, yes. Um, I'm not sure whether you want to go into this at this stage, but I think the whole question of monitoring and evaluation is extremely complex. And I think the first thing would be to really set up an interdisciplinary group, if it doesn't already exist, in order to look at the strategy and then set in, in train a, a series of actions that need to be taken to monitor and evaluate. And critically, there needs to be baseline data before implementation and also sufficient fo follow-up, because often... It, it, the, these are things that actually aren't considered. But it, it, I think it is so complex in terms of what we're monitoring, um, what the metrics are, whether it's average uh, daily or average annual, that we, we need to look at this in more detail. And I think it is in the place of the expert working group. Thank you. Olivia. Going on from basically what everybody has said, I think it's really important that the data isn't collected in silos. Joining up data is key to ensuring that we have a uniform approach. And as Jane Clare mentioned about local authorities having some accountability, it's kind of difficult for them to have that if there is an oversight over what they're supposed to be doing. And so joining up data really would be important for achieving that. Thank you very much. Ivan McKee. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Convener, the area I wanted to explore, and it kind of follows on from what he's talking there about how we measure things, is just to try and get a sense of the, the scale of the problem um, and, um, and, and, and uh, that will maybe help us focus on how we, how we go about tackling it. Because when we read through our papers, there's, there's a bit, bit of conflicting data. Um, at the one level, there's some big numbers in there about the number of deaths that there are and how that compares to road accidents, and it's much worse at a societal level than that, which is obviously a high-profile issue in itself. Um, when you actually drill into some of the data points, and you know, I'm something from the British Lung Foundation that says only 3.5% of um, emergency respiratory and cardio admissions to hospitals were due to air pollution, which means 96.5% are due to something else, which kind of suggests that there are much, much bigger fish to fry if we're looking at how do we tackle that particular issue. So it was really just to understand that. The, the second part of that is we're talking about um, numbers that appear to be low and coming down. The, 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 the WHO, the EU standard for the uh, for the, the, the annual um, for 2020 uh, on the PM 2.5 is 20 micrograms per cubic metre. WHO is 10 micrograms per cubic metre, which the Scottish Government signed up to. The Scottish number is now down at five um, and coming down, um, which kind of suggests that we're sort of in not a bad place and going in the right direction, but that again runs counter to some of the other messages that are coming out. So we really just understand where we are in that. Um, 
PM 2.5, is that the key thing we should be measuring? Is PM 10 important? Um, how important is NO2, NOx? Are there other things we should be measuring as well? Um, and um, yeah, yeah, so just, and, and sorry, and the third part of that is what are the biggest impacts? We tend to be focusing on vehicle pollutants. Is that the lion's share of it? Because we don't have any data on that. Our uh, agriculture's mentioned, we'd burn stoves are mentioned. Is it cars, is it buses, is it freight? Are there any data that says this is where the biggest impact is? If we fix the car thing, if we're 100% electric vehicles, would that fix the problem? Um, what impact would that have on the numbers? So I think there's a lot of stuff in the data there that I'm not clear about, and others obviously may have more perspective they can share on that to allow us to focus on how big the problem is and where we should be focused. There's a lot in there. I wonder if I could start with Colin Ramsey. Uh, thank you. There's a lot of questions in there, actually. Um, I mean, I think taking the last one first, <laughs> since the one I remember most clearly, I mean, I think it's the issue is about transport-related air pollution in general is probably the biggest contributor to preventable air pollution that, that we can tackle now. And I think that uh, affects any um, combustion engine vehicle, really. So it's not just cars, but it's also buses, lorries, etc., etc., etc. And I think that the point about it being that it's very location specific in terms of what the major contributor is. So Glasgow, for example, have done a lot of work analysing the uh, traffic mix in the centre of Glasgow, um, and have identified that buses are contributing significantly to the excess nitrogen dioxide and PM pollution there, um, whereas outside the centre of Glasgow, its cars are contributing relatively more. So it's not a simple picture by any means, but I think the, the message essentially is that combustion engine uh, vehicles are a, a significant cause of traffic-related pollution, and that's where the targeting is currently focused in terms of trying to reduce that. I mean, in terms of the, the data issue, that is an incredibly complex issue. Um, and. Uh, uh, the best, uh, in terms of summarising it, the best evidence, I think the most robust evidence, is in relation to particulate pollution, really, uh, and PM 2.5 especially, and and all the work that's been done by COMIAT, for example, the committee's medical um, committee of, uh, on uh, medical effects of air pollution. They they are the ones who came out with the estimates, the most um, robust estimates of the effect of excess PM 2.5 pollution on uh, mortality. Um, and they also looked at um, cardiovascular mortality and lung cancer, et cetera. And um, they did a review of all the information a number of years ago. Um, I think it was published in 2010. And at that time, they came out with the estimates that are commonly banded around now that for um, uh, an increase, I think it's um, of, of 10 micrograms um, of, 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 of PM 2.5, that there's a 6% increase in <laughs> overall mortality. Um, they have, uh, there will be an updated report coming from COMIAP on that. Um, but I think the message is going to be that that, that figure of 6% excess mortality across the board is a robust estimate based on newer international studies, really. I think the evidence in relation to um, other pollutants is more controversial, particularly nitrogen dioxide. And again, COMIAP are in the process of finalising a report, which is a review of the evidence in relation to nitrogen dioxide and nitrogen oxides in particular. And it's much more difficult to quantify precisely what the impacts of those are because there's a very clear interrelationship between particulate pollution and nitrogen dioxide pollution, for example. Um, there are also effects due to other pollutants like ozone, etc. And again, that varies um, depending on the circumstances. Um, uh, you know, uh, ozone paradoxically is often higher in rural communities um, because the ozone is mopped up in urban areas by the other pollutants. Um, so it's a very, very complex picture in terms of the data. Um, uh, we have been looking more recently at trying to get uh, a better handle on the data in Scotland, and I've been working with some colleagues in Glasgow University and Strathclyde University looking at that. Um, and what we've been trying to do is look at it on a small area basis, and this was really trying to estimate what the impacts of low emission zones might be. Um, and the evidence that we have looked at most recently tends to suggest that the strongest associations in terms of a, a, an identifiable impact are to do with respiratory hospital admissions and PM 2.5. And that's the, the, actually the strongest one. And that the, the association with nitrogen dioxide is actually far less. Um, uh, and that's important because the focus of low emission zones is actually on nitrogen dioxide rather than particulates. So um, I, I could go on at great length, but I think it's, it's the, the, the short message is it's a very, very complex picture. Um, you know, we are continuing to uh, accumulate more and more data on it. But I think the consistent message is robust in that, you know, particulates especially are, are a key issue, but that the other pollutants are important as well, and it's important we try to reduce all of them. Thank you. Uh, David Newby. 
Yeah, I just want to support uh, Colin's comments there. I think <clears throat> first thing to say, I think if you're going to pick one, I think PM 2.5 is probably the best one to pick. Um, uh, and we can argue about all of that, but I think we do need better PM 2.5 monitoring, uh, certainly in Scotland, because it, it, often it's just 10 that's recorded and we need better monitoring because that is the, the key one. Second point I think um, I wanted to flag up again is the traffic issue. That is that is the biggest issue. If you look at maps of air pollution exposure, it all maps to um, transport uh, corridors. It, it's all down to traffic, uh, a lot of this. And of course where there's traffic there's people. Um, so um, this is the main focus. Um, in terms of your first question around uh, is it that important, um, if you look at um, the uh, global assessment of avoidable causes of death, and there are many of those, obesity and, and other things, in the top ten there are three that are air pollution, uh, and in the top five there are two, uh, and, that, and, and one of those is mostly around traffic-derived air pollution. Um, so it is up there, and that's a global perspective. What about Scotland and the UK? Well, um, that is still just as relevant, and, um, and I think uh, we do need to uh, sort this problem out. Uh, we do need cleaner cars, cleaner engines, they are coming, but we need to encourage that. Uh, I have an electric car, I have trouble plugging it in. What's going on? Uh, as you saw, I walked in with my cycle kit. Why can't I cycle not in a diesel infested <coughs> traffic that uh, I get, for my self-righteousness, uh, I get to be pushed into the bus lane with the taxis that are all diesel. What's going on? We need to do better than that, surely. We need to be encouraging people. Why don't people cycle on the roads? Because it's dangerous and because of the pollution. We need to sort this. So we do need, uh, and of course it's not an instant fix, and I know there are many barriers to getting people on active transport, but these are the sorts of things that we need to, we do need to fix. We do need legislation to help us encourage people to do the right thing. Sure. Thanks. Pick up on Professor Newby's point around the, the act of travel. Um, that's something that's absolutely crucial to all of this because it's, it's getting cars off the road. And I think that's why not, on, not only are they the biggest emitters of the, of the pollution in the urban areas, if we tackle car use, that that's, has bigger public health benefits. If you're getting people like walking and moving, it, it goes across different health policies in terms of tackling obesity and mental health issues. There are much, much bigger benefits here. And that's why things like low emission zone and or clear clean air zones have to be um, ambitious because there's no point if you just look at maybe just increasing a, a few electric vehicle charging points whilst they're important we need they need to be ambitious we need to talk about changing the cities they need to be much more um easy for people to walk and cycle to work we need to tackle private car use it has to be all encompassing and that's why things like glasgow city's first attempt at a low emission zone has been quite disappointing because it doesn't seem to go as far as it as it needs to be <clears throat> thank you very much uh jane claire then uh sorry um, i totally take ivan's point about you know, when you look at the figures it's difficult sometimes to understand well, what's the, what's the thing that we should be doing but also looking at a figure and saying well if you compare this to this then, then what is the biggest problem um i think as a charity the way that, that i've been looking at it and it might be a slightly different sort of standpoint is that if we count up the number of people with copd the number of people that have any sort of chest condition and um, that have ipf for example um, if we look at that and add those figures up we're, we're looking at not shy of about six hundred thousand people in scotland asthma alone is over three hundred fifty. 50,000 people will have had it at some point, even if they might have, you know, childhood asthma, you might grow out of it, but somebody will have been affected by it. And those numbers are big, you know, and they're quite scary. So, so even if those people are not admitted to hospital through A&E, or even if it doesn't show up as an acute um, uh, condition uh, being affected by it, day to day, they will be being affected by it out of those 600,000 odd people they're not sitting in clean air all the time. There might be some people who are, but most people won't be. Um, so for us, that's a big issue. There's a second issue around stroke and heart disease, because we know that um, particle matter affects that as well. So we, you know, we tend to think about clean air about people um, with chest conditions, but it's broader than that. Um, so we have to take that into account. There are other effects going on um, uh, for people's health there. Um, and so for us, you know, if we start to add those numbers up, um, you're not getting shy of probably one in five of the population who are directly affected um, by air quality every day. Um, I think there's something 
something else. I, I totally agree with, with Colin and David around the, the comments that they are making. And I, I quite like the fact that David's bringing just a little bit of tempered anger to the discussion as well around his particular situation. And, and I think that's absolutely right, because um, we do have to take quite a big step, I think, in order to tackle this. Um, and in terms of active travel, um, as, a, as a woman who used to cycle, and I don't anymore, because it is far too dangerous. Um, and we have a culture um, in Scotland that is not replicated in Northern Europe, for example, if you look at Copenhagen, which has a similar weather um, to us, so we can't even you know, use the excuse of rain. Um, uh, but we do have to look at that in terms of, you know, transport is the biggest problem in terms of this, but it's also the biggest problem in terms of people actually accessing employment, accessing the health service. Um, the health service itself, um, you know, in the paperwork that's been brought to the committee has said, you know, it's, it's part of the problem because it's one of the biggest employers. Um, uh, so we, we have to look at that in the round. I think the final thing I would say on it is that, that there's also needs to be a shift, I think, in thinking that when we look at tobacco, it was about a shift in the rights of people to have access to clean air over the rights of an industry to sell an addictive product. Um, and that, that was difficult to do and it took a long time. And this parliament took a great stand on that and took great leadership on that issue. And I think we have to move towards that position and also move just from talking about it from an environmental perspective, important though that is, to disease prevention and actually thinking about it in a more holistic manner that it affects everybody in Scotland at some point. Because ultimately, one thing that we all do is breathe and that we can't get away from that. That has to happen for us to continue. So I think we need to put that importance on there um, and make sure that we see it as that priority. Thank you very much. Sally. I think my comment follows very nicely on from what you said. You mentioned tobacco. Um, the smoke-free legislation, um, which I was involved in monitoring, the, evaluating the impact of, really was quite dramatic. Prior to the introduction of the legislation, it was estimated that there were 865 deaths per annum from second-hand smoke. It is a little bit different in terms of the dynamics compared with air pollution, but we're here we have an estimated 2,000 deaths associated. So the potential impact, I think, of legislation is quite considerable. Um, the evaluation of the health consequences of the legislation, the improvements were an improvement of respiratory health, 15% reduction in childhood asthmas, dramatically a 17% reduction in acute coronary syndrome, um, that, that's essentially heart attack. Um, and really, it was re that was really across the board. We saw a population level fall in exposure and also, quite unexpectedly, an improvement in perinatal outcomes. This has also been um, measured in terms of improvements in air quality, out, outdoor, uh, outdoor air pollution. Uh, so I think the potential here is considerable, but it needs to have a structure for implementation and enforcement and evaluation. I just wanted to pick up on a question that Ivan McKee asked um, some time ago now. The very first question you asked, you mentioned how do, how do we understand this? We have sudden um, acute admissions uh, for, uh, as a result of um, air pollution. I think we need to differentiate between the acute effects of, of exposure to air pollution and the longer term effects. And in a sense, the longer term effects of long term exposure, which relate to your issues of community, it is really quite considerable. So I think we need to bear in mind those two, two things. Thank you very much. Uh, Olivia. Just to add a quick thing, um, David Newby mentioned essentially behavioural change and it's, it really is key to be able to facilitate that behavioural change. Individuals can't make it on their own and something like electric cars, whilst they are important, it would be great to get cars off the road, more cars off the road overall, electric or otherwise, and creating an environment that people can cycle and walk and run outside is really important because as it stands, for people with asthma, they have to make their own behavioural change when it comes to things like air pollution by avoiding going outside that's a really drastic decision and it affects their ability to work, to attend school and it you know, creates social isolation. It would be much easier for everybody if we could create an environment that we could all live in quite comfortably as opposed to individuals who are more from the more vulnerable section of society having to stay inside all day. Thank you. Quick supplementary, David Stewart. Just an observation around the question, convener. I think also we need to look at the role that freight plays in our cities. That's very polluting. Uh, in a previous committee, I went to the Netherlands to see consolidation centres, which is where freight goes externally to the city, and low emission electric vehicles are used to take freight from the large warehouses. I was on an electric bike, for example, to take freight, which is absolutely fascinating. But that does require a step change. And as Olivia said, a change in attitudes. And let's remember, in, as Alec Hamilton will know, in Edinburgh, when we had a uh, referendum on 
um, congestion uh, zones, that was defeated. You know, we've got to take the public with us, and that includes taking hauliers with us as well. So I, I agree that we have to give up something to get a longer gain light in the smoking ban, uh, but that doesn't mean the public are necessarily with us currently. So that, that's the worry I have as a politician, how we make that step change. Very fair point. Uh, yeah. Ivan. Was, that was excellent. Thanks very much to all the, the folk that contributed. It clarified a lot of things for me. I was a, a bit concerned as a comment that, the, that Colin Ramsey made, that the low emission zones are focused on NO2 rather than PM2.5, whereas PM2.5 is seen to be the, the, the biggest issue. So that's a, a bit of a concern. Um, and I suppose just to follow up on the electric vehicles, what I also heard was that it's internal combustion engine that's the problem. And I suppose to go back to my other point, does that mean that if tomorrow we were 100% electric vehicles and, and I, take, I, I completely understand the active travel issues and I'm not dismissing that but that's a different debate um, that we can deal with separately and I'm, I'm nobody's more supportive of active travel than myself um, but if we could wave the magic wand and we were 100% electric vehicles would that largely fix the PM2.5 and the air pollution issue? Colin? Yeah, so to an extent, I mean it, it would certainly help reduce it further I mean, I think <clears throat> PM 2.5, you have to bear in mind that not all PM 2.5 is associated with transport. There's, there's PM 2.5 from other sources, which we can do nothing about, transboundary airflow, et cetera, et cetera. And also, even if you have um, vehicles that don't have combustion engines, um, yeah, you've got tyre wear and you've got brake wear, so that contributes to fine particulates as well. So unless you got rid of uh, vehicular transport altogether, it's unlikely uh, you would massively reduce it. And I think we have to bear in mind um, the current context in Scotland, and the fact of the matter is, in, in a, if you look at the, the levels uh, and you look at the trends, um, uh, although all of us want to try and improve things further, we have to acknowledge the fact that Scotland has actually got amongst the lowest levels of PM2.5 based on the monitoring that we've currently got. So I think we have to be realistic in terms of what we think there is scope for reducing it further by. Uh, and clearly, the, the, the area we can tackle is through preventable use of, of, of combustion engine transport. But I think we have to be realistic about you know, what the ultimate target might be and how much more room there is for reduction. Um, so I think we just have to bear that in mind. Presumably on buses and on freight, which have been mentioned, uh, hydrogen power is equally effective yes. in, in removing that uh, impact. Dave Newby. Yeah, I was just going to raise the point that um, all PM 2.5 isn't made equal, so uh, whilst I completely uh, agree with Colin. Uh, obviously, the combustion-derived PM2.5 from traffic is the one that causes the health problems. So the, some of the road tyre stuff, there is some evidence it can, but the predominant adverse effect is from the, tr uh, the, the pollution. So if you said to me, if we were all electric, lorries, cars, buses, that would be brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And I think it would make an impact, and I think it would reduce things. I think some of the other things about... You know, our air pollution levels are brilliant. Well, yes, but where are we monitoring it and where are the people? So, you know, some of these monitoring stations aren't uh, on Sookie Hall Street, aren't on uh, Princess Street. So you're getting background levels. That's what they're designed to look for is background levels. But when you're actually on the road, um, your levels are very high. And, and, of course, they exponentially decay as you move from the roadside uh, because the, the, they disperse very rapidly. So what someone will... Uh, um, uh, experience at the roadside will not be reflected in the monitoring stations. Um, so the trend might be, but overall the actual level will be very different. And of course, talking about vulnerable groups and children, again, they're in buggies right down by where the exhaust pipes are. You know, there are all these sorts of issues that, that people need to remember um, before being too complacent. We've got some of the best air quality in the world. And of course, Scotland is a rural country. So again, there are issues there about traffic dispersion as well. So we shouldn't be too complacent on this. And, and I think we touched on the need for more monitoring. And perhaps we need to monitor in more of the more appropriate places where people live and work. Thank you very much. A brief supplementary, Brian Whitlock. Um, if I could, uh, I, I want to associate myself with some of the comments that uh, Dave Newby made around active travel and how difficult it is to get on your bike. Uh, I'm doing it less and less myself these days, I have to say, because of ex exactly what you said in terms of the, the pollutant and, and also some, the, the state of the road. Another comment that it strikes me around electric cars is if, if, if we, um, we manage to get many, many more electric cars on the road, then we'd be more likely to get on our bike because it'd be less pollutant. But I think with, with discussing active travel, I'm, I just... 
I think that requires a big shift change in planning, and I just wonder whether what what do you think around the um, are we aggressive enough in our in our, in our transport infrastructure planning when we're having major transport infrastructure redesign? Is there enough cognizance given to active travel, and and, and what more does the, the the planning play within that that, that environment? Respond yeah, to that because I, I think you know. Uh, Sorry to bring the trams into this, but you know, if we spent that amount of money on, instead of on an electric thing that goes on one track, making the centre of Edinburgh a, 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 a cycle-laned pedestrian area, that uh, and have protected cycle lanes across the city, what for the same amount of money, what would that difference have made? Uh, and and I and I think planning is key to this. We, we do. Yes, we've inherited a beautiful historic city cities across Scotland. Uh, and, and doing cycle lanes is not easy, but many centres do this. Many places in the world, Europe does this. It has a historic past, and yet it still manages to deliver it. We do need better planning, definitely. Miranda Lowen, then. I just want to comment um, back on this issue. I think Colin mentioned it about you know how the low emission zones are based on NO2, um, but there's this idea of meeting regulations, and then there's this idea of making a better place for people. And I think that's really what you know, we'd all like. So you can always do better, even if you meet the regulations. I think you, know, you don't want to just stop there. And I think um, by doing things like getting more cars off the road, I think you know, it's great to have you know, no emission cars, but there are still issues around that. And I think what we want to do is make a, a place that's healthier for everybody. And so um, I think taking a broader approach is important and I think that's really the way to to address this because it's not just targeting one thing it's not just having a low emission zone it's not just um, targeting freight for example but you know by addressing freight issues you are making a nicer city to be in as well so I think um, you know it's something that requires a very broad approach and things that don't necessarily seem very obvious to address air pollution may also have that impact as well. And I think the other thing we want to be um, concerned about is that you know we don't want to just move air pollution. We want to actually make sure that everybody um, is positively impacted. And some unintended uh, consequences of policies may be a shifting of uh, bus routes elsewhere, for example, um, or just moving more polluting vehicles to another community. I'll call Hamden. I think you have a question on the same theme. Thank you, Convener. Yes, it picks up very nicely on the last two contributions. As things stand, 5% of my constituents in Edinburgh Western will die because of air pollution. Edinburgh is top of the pops in that rather macabre league table of, uh, of pre preventable deaths due to air quality. Um, and my constituency has two of Scotland's most polluted, top 10 most polluted streets in St John's Road in Castrophon and in Queen's Ferry Road. So um, this is really important to me. I'm sure it's as well as important to everybody. But I'd like to ask the panel, um, what, uh, from what we've heard about planning, whether this is never considered, this is not considered currently and whether planning uh, decisions are granted or not. So, for example, we've had a proliferation of housing development in West Edinburgh, which are feeding the arterial routes I've described, adding traffic, which uh, Professor Newby described as being absolutely key to this problem. So in terms of the, the whole place solution to this, do we need to um, uh, change planning legislation so that planning will be refused if it's going to compound those, those really toxic zones? Um, are we ambitious enough on that switch over to electric vehicles? in terms of the dates that governments both here and in Westminster have set in terms of the, the, the time by which we'll end fuel uh, internal combustion production? And are we, um, should we take some radical decisions around freight as well? Because, I mean, one of the problems we have in our constituency is is the, the, the lorries going through these very narrow arterial corridors. If we, we were to start getting radical about moving that into different modes of transport. So the whole place solution, if you please. Clear. And then Colin. Um, yes. sorry, just to take the, fir the first point, there is in the Clean Air for Scotland um, strategy, there are points and recommendations with regards to placemaking and planning policy. Um, I can't remember them all now. I don't have them in front of me. Um, but from memory, there are lots of suggestions 
of um, you know future placemaking plans will take into consideration air quality. We'll look at how maybe air quality might. It's lots of suggestions of how things might go. Um, there's nothing concrete with regards, as far as I can remember, with regards to planning decisions. And it comes back to a point that I think a, a number of us have made in our submissions and that uh, points raised in the Environment Committee and their air quality inquiry, inquiry in terms of the progress report and the updates we get on cleaner air for Scotland and how we're meeting those recommendations and those action points. So I, I, I absolutely agree. I think there's a lot more to be done around it, but it's not really clear at this point in time who's doing what. Colin Ramsey. Yeah, I was just going to echo some of those points. I mean, I think um, in relation to the CAFs and the CAFs governance group, there are planners who are represented on that group, and I think there is an increasing understanding amongst the planning community of the need to uh, understand the impacts of development in terms of air pollution. Uh, and evidence was taken from uh, Holland, for example, where they have a different system in relation to planning in that any new development effectively has to calculate an air pollution budget associated with a new development. And if it exceeds their, their existing uh, air pollution levels, then they have to design in mitigating measures to mop up that extra air pollution. Um, so I think that people are aware that there are lessons to be learned from other countries. I think efforts have been made through the CAF's governance group to try and uh, uh, promote those. And I know that there are developments with the planning community and, uh, uh, through education, etc., to emphasise the need for them to be more aware of it. So, uh, and I think the, the placemaking and the, the work that um, uh, NHS Health Scotland have done in terms of designing an audit tool, for example, on placemaking, uh, are ways which we're trying to encourage the planning community to understand their role because it is absolutely key to it. Okay. Uh, Jane Kerry Johnson. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm really interested in the planning angle and the sort of holistic approach to that um, and the sort of place making. I, I do feel that it needs to be toughened up a little bit. It feels like an optional extra is something that we might do if we manage to fit it in rather than something that's a basic um, line within um, our planning at the moment. Um, and, and I love a bit of anecdata because that's really good when you're sitting in front of people who deal in evidence every day. Um, but I was supporting a friend to decide on, on whether to buy a house a couple of weeks ago and we went to a new housing estate that's being built. It will remain nameless. And one of the things that I noticed is that it only had uh, a pavement down one side of the road and I asked if that was because we were in the show home bit and I thought maybe that's why this is, is only one side and the answer was no that the whole estate will be like this and I was really you know sort of surprised because I thought well I don't understand how people can walk about then if they don't have pavements on either side of the road and I was being very critical and I was going to say this is terrible and I don't understand how could this get passed of course the person was like I thought I was just showing you a house but you know now we've gone into a whole issue around placemaking um, but the really interesting answer back was, in actual fact, they were trying to build in some of the, the planning that Holland has done and that other parts of Europe have done. But what they've done is they've planned it in without the culture change. So that won't work for us at the moment, because in actual fact, when I look at it, I think, oh, how will I walk about? How will I get my buggy down the road? Because we're not there yet to say, in actual fact, people should be able to wander down the streets because pedestrians have a right of way over traffic um, within a housing estate. So there's definitely something about we, we might be doing some things, but in actual fact, we've not made the culture change around it. I'd also like to make another point about um, areas of deprivation. And I think a lot of the active transport stuff and a lot of the planning issues, to my mind, and I'm going to be a little bit bold here, do fit into a bit of a middle class bracket. Um, and I'm going to use the phrase mammal, middle aged men in Lycra, to illustrate the point, <laughs> which is that <laughs> might be some of them here. <laughs> but I think there is something around the fact that in. In many in countries in Europe, when you see people who are doing active transport, there's an element of where they've not got it fully right in terms of that issue yet, but it is a lot more accessible. At the moment, if you want to be a cyclist, you have to go to a cycle shop and buy a specialist bike and specialist equipment in order to be able to do that. And that's not the case in, in other cities and in other countries. And so I think even walking, which we think of as a free activity, isn't actually that free. Um, so I think we do need to sort of build that in as well, is that when we're looking at planning, how, how accessible is some of the things that we are doing and asking people, Livia is absolutely right, we're asking people to make changes that we're not making as a society alongside them. Um, so we have to sort of integrate those two things together. Thank you very much. Sally Hall. Then. Again, following on from what you said, you mentioned culture change and that culture shift is really one of the most difficult things to do. Uh, Behaviour change is terribly difficult. Um, one of the really striking things, and I'm going to go back to the smoke-free legislation again, um, was the gradual build-up of information 
firstly about the dangers of secondhand smoke exposure, then about what the legislation might do, then about what your responsibilities were. It was very broad brush. It included leaflets, it included leaflet drops to every household, and it included, very importantly, I think, a very high-profile mass media campaign, because that hits everybody. It's expensive, but your hit into the population is really quite large. And I think that that communication campaign really was part of the success. What was really striking was that before the legislation, it was primarily the non-smokers who were supportive. As it came nearer the date, smokers began to switch. And when after the legislation was introduced, the smokers actually changed their attitude. They became very positive. I think because car ownership is the main, is the dominant theme here, they are the majority. We really have to hit the car, car owner and really shift their opinion. And it may be you actually have to move before the opinion has completely changed. But find, you, you may well find that once things are in place, there is a much more positive attitude. Emma Harper, a supplementary. Just regarding to the planning and the Clean Air for Scotland strategy, I mean, there's a debate this afternoon in chamber that the Environment Committee are, are debating the inquiry into air quality. And one of the issues in the report is that um, it's a cross-portfolio issue to tackle air quality. So transport and um, Environment Secretary, as well as um, the Housing Minister. But there are calls for... Um, like, a, a, I guess, a more a joined up approach from all the portfolios. So I'm assuming the panel would support that or even at strengthening that. And Cabinet Secretary Ms Cunningham said that her particular concern is to ensure that when new housing developments are put in place, an understanding of transport issues is part and parcel of that. So this report seems to be heading in the right direction. So is it strong enough, though, as far as planning and policy? That would be the question. Um, uh, I'm going to confess that I don't own any lycra at all, and uh, but I, I think po um, person, I think you know, change of views and, and attitudes is, is challenging, and I, I don't want to belittle that. And I think people's perception of people cycling lycra is, is very common. Uh, and and when I talk to people about going to work, and, and I cycle probably about 40 miles a week, just going to and from the hospitals around Edinburgh. Uh, I go in my suit as I am today, and people don't can't believe that I cycle in a suit. And don't your patients complain of you smelling? Well, they don't complain yet. Um, maybe they're just being very polite. I don't know, but there is this perception that you can't cycle and work uh, and, uh, and do some kind of job. My bike is a very cheap, rusty old thing, uh, which I recently replaced with another cheap bike. They're not expensive, and it, it's all about views and perceptions. Uh, and most journeys are incredibly short. They don't need to be made in a car. Um, if, uh, and um, you know, some of my patients get upset when they lose their driving licence. And I point out that I travel the whole of Scotland on the train with my bike. It's about attitude. I've always done that. It's been part of my mentality. Perhaps I'm just a bit odd. But uh, I think you know, it, it is making it easier for people. The, the comment about the, the, the road. W were there any cycle paths on this new estate? I suspect not. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> Why not? That, you know, this has to be, uh, has to be a norm for a new estate has to have cycle lanes. Why not? What's going on? Clear signs. Um, and just picking up on the, the public health campaign, that's something we'd really like to see because it's about, like you said, telling people you don't need to be a professional cyclist to get into work and giving people, you know, showing them how, how it can be done differently. But also it's about dispelling myths that exist. I've heard a number, number of people say, you know, they've, they're not cycling as much because of safety concerns. That's fair enough. And because of the pollution, when actually increasing evidence shows that you are exposed to much higher levels of pollution inside a car than outside of it. And people are thinking, you know, I'm not going to push walk my children along the side of the road because of the pollution. They put them in their car. It's up to 12 times more pollution inside the car. Um, and other people, we get calls to the organisation asking about um, face masks and will that protect them and they think they do and actually most of the time they don't because the p pollution and the particulates are so small they get through anyway. So there's a lot of misinformation out there and misunderstanding and a, a really big campaign I think would, would really help that. I want to move now to the wider question of uh, uh, air quality in relation to health inequality and start with Jenny Goldruth. Thank you convener and good morning uh, to the panel. Um, 
With regard to Olivia Allen's point uh, in terms of behaviour change, I wanted to pick up on that point. In your submission, uh, you suggest that a reduction in the number of all types of cars is necessary to further lower the health risks uh, posed by particulate matter. And Jane Claire Judson, in your submission, you point to health inequalities, as you've mentioned previously, and you say that it's the right to health as a fundamental human right, and poor health inequalities uh, should be uh, treated as an infringement of that right. Um, in my own constituency, Leavenmouth, um, it's the largest urban conurbation in Scotland with no direct rail link. Um, and health inequalities and actually child poverty in general is high in that part of Scotland. So do you think, therefore, there's a disconnect between our aspirations in terms of health and transport? Yes. <laughs> the short answer to that, I guess. Um, and I think it goes back to the point about the, the um, integration of portfolios, I think, that Emma said. Um, and I think that there is... It is very complex. I, mean, I absolutely understand why it's really hard to look at um, you know, the transport policy in one um, area of government and then to look at health and then to bring into account the fact that there's health um, inequalities and, and they're affected by factors that don't start with health always. Um, so I absolutely accept that. But yes, I think you know, we're, we're a small nation in a sense. You know, we've got five million people roughly uh, and in some ways it shouldn't be beyond the wit of us to, to, to look at that and to understand how to do that better. But I absolutely accept the, the, the structural issues that we have in terms of how we work um, um, on that. But I know that Olivia will have... Um, more comment on that as well. Um, just to um, add on, I think what we've sort of been discussing as well about planning and involving the public is a really Im important avenue to take. I think um, Copenhagen is quite a good example where they got people who cycle to, t to point out different routes on a map that are problematic mm -hmm. and where other useful routes would be. So if the, I'm not entirely sure how much involvement the public has in your planning procedures, but if there could be a public consultation involving people who are li living in more marginalised communities, yeah. then perhaps there'd be improvement in terms of getting rail links out there and offering those alternatives. Absolutely, and in terms of facilitating that behavioural change, exactly. because there might be a real link for people to use. They, they can't use it at the moment, yeah. it's not there. Um, I have a real interest, actually, with regard to my own constituency at the moment, um, more broadly. Um, Jean Claire Johnson, just to go back to another one of your points, you also highlight then, in terms of what you've said there, uh, that it must be seen, seen air pollution as... Um, not purely as an environmental issue. We need to urgently address poor air quality as priority in targeted areas where people who are more vulnerable uh, are at greater risk, and this is in terms of health inequalities. And Claire Shanks, in your submission, you point to NHS boards uh, and their local authority partners requiring to include reference to air quality and health in the next revision of their joint health protection plans, which should identify and address specific local priority issues, which is a quote from the Cleaner Air for Scotland. Um, to what extent then do you believe that the air quality should be strategically linked to the outcomes of health and social care partnerships um, nationally and at local level as well? Should it be embedded in terms of those outcomes? And are any of you aware of any good practice that's happening currently across the country in that respect? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I mean, I would say yes. I mean, the, the, the joint plans, um, the responsibility to reference it, um, which I don't feel goes... I mean, I could reference anything, <laughs> but it doesn't mean I would have to act on it. Um, so I think we should toughen that up a little, and I think that we should be um, uh, creating better... Sort of outcomes-based targets, if you like, in terms of health that cut across all of the portfolios that we have. And, uh, you know, the integrated joint boards should go some way to help us with that, but we know that that's a challenge there um, as well, you know, and, and, and that, that integration needs to be supported around their own culture change around that. I mean, in terms of good practice, certainly I think Glasgow's done a huge amount of work in terms of um, the sort of Glasgow life work and trying to bring the whole city together to look at city-wide um, approaches and are looking at admission rates. But I, I don't feel, and, and the academics around the table might be better than I am on this, I guess what I feel is that the pockets of best practice are so small at the moment that they're not scalable enough. They're small projects being led by, if you like, personality leadership, people who are committed to this cause, rather than um, you know, a commitment strategically to change this across Scotland. And, and we see that with the clean air strategy, that it's not gone as far as, as we would all have hoped it would be. So I, th I think there's definitely something to look at in terms of how do we build in um, those outcomes. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll declare a bit of a, a conflict of interest. I sit on the board of, of Health Scotland, um, and they've also you know, submitted um, to this committee and, and there's a, a clear commitment in, in terms of what I see in terms of health of that public health reform that that change that we want to see within Scotland that we actually you know take public health and really turn it into something very different from just looking at it as an NHS issue to look at a, a, you know as a health sector issue to look at and of course that that's happening at the moment that that work is happening at the moment but I would certainly be urging people to look towards that and to be influencing that process to say the public health outcomes have to have um, clean air quality within that and definitely in terms of vulnerable groups, the investment has to go into that, that preventative spend. So the reason I'm 
Jenny. is that um, over the Easter recess, NH, uh, sorry, it was actually the Health and Social Care Partnership in Fife took the decision to close out of our services in Glenrothes in my constituency in St Andrews and Dunfermline. I thought that was really interesting with regard to air pollution because the decision of the Health and Social Care Partnership is going to directly increase emissions because all patients will now be directed to the Victoria in Kirkcaldy as a result. Um, so actually, the strategic decision of that Health and Social Care Partnership goes against all our aspirations in terms of, of air pollution. Uh, and with regard to, to your submission, um, uh, Jane Clare, you, you say that many lung conditions are chronic, meaning that people living with those conditions can become heavily dependent on health and social uh, and uh, care services. So they're actually further away then from, from uh, the services themselves. And I also thought it was really interesting in the submission, I think it was perhaps from Claire Shanks actually, and you highlight England's chief medical officer has recently highlighted in her annual report the NHS is a high polluter and should take action. Um, the NHS has obviously taken action here um, because you know, it's encouraging people to use more transport. Um, there's a disconnect, surely, then, between the strategic aspirations and what's actually happening. Um, so I wonder, therefore, what the panel's views are uh, with regard to how those strategic actions can help to increase or decrease uh, health inequalities. Thank you very much. Uh, does anyone want to... Jane, Jane Clare can, can, can go again, of course, but... Just I think the, only very, the, other the very quick comment I would make is I, I wouldn't want to comment on an individual situation within a health board. I think that, that I would put myself in a position the health board wouldn't be that appreciative of. Um, I think, though, that there's, uh, there has to be an understanding, though, I think, of the uh, connectivity across um, the different sort of sectors in Scotland. And, and I think that that should be accepted at a strategic level and at a local level. I think there's definitely something about local community planning in there as well and how that works and how people are consulted and looking at this sort of panel based approach, the placemaking uh, based approach, I think, would help with that. So I, I take the point, but I think as well, it's it's one of those issues where I feel that that is a local issue where for me to comment on that, it wouldn't be entirely appropriate. And I think it comes back to what we were saying about, um, I said in my question about the fact that it is just, the CAFS just says for the health boards to reference air quality and there's just not enough guidance there really it's, it all falls under this this idea we've been saying about better education that's not just for the public it's for people in the health services as well it's for the public so that they know what they're doing and if you look at the different references through joint health protection plans some really do get the 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 need to to look at prevention and guiding people towards active travel and better health choices. Some of them were just saying they were going to manage acute episodes. So I think there needs to be better guidance for those health boards to make those decisions and to know whenever they're making strategic decisions that might what effect that might have in terms of air quality, because at the moment I don't think they have that information. Sandra White. Uh, thank you very much, much Kevin. I'm still sort of a getting over the Middle East men in Lycra. It was a bit of a shock trying to, to get that out of my <laughs> out of my out of my head in, in that respect. But I wanted to pick up on, on a kind of theme that's in the papers and also has been mentioned uh, when we're talking about health inequalities. Um, it seems to mention constantly the most disadvantaged areas. Uh, well, obviously in my constituency, I represent some areas that are not disadvantaged, such as the West End of Glasgow, which is they call it the leafy West End. Uh, but in my area, Byers Road is amongst the highest for air pollution also and obviously Glasgow City Centre Hope Street is one of the highest as well and it is absolute traffic in, the, in that respect. So I, I just wondered, that I know that uh, we have some very good educated people in these areas who actually monitor the air quality within the high up tenement buildings uh, and I agree with uh, Professor Newby about kids and buggies but you also get the pollution in these tenement buildings higher up with the, the traffic going forward. So I'd like to make that point uh, and, and ask the panel if, if they are agreeable. It's not just you know areas of deprivation, it's the heaviness of the traffic. It can happen anywhere in, in that respect. And I know it's a long-term educational issue we've got to look at. So I'd like to you know hear the panel's views on that, but I'd also like to hear their views on the fact that at the moment, we're looking at green lungs within the city, and Glasgow City Council has been very good in that. What can we do to improve some of the quality at this moment in time? Uh, planting more trees, giving more green lungs within areas like the city centre in Glasgow, Sucky Hall Street, or whatever, because it will take a long time, unfortunately. So is there anything we can do, not immediately, but yeah, mostly immediately, uh, to sort of balance this out for people who are living within city centres and within, you know, Byers Road and areas like that as well, and in Edinburgh too. Thank you very much. Uh, Colin Ramsey. Um, I mean, just in relation to that point, I mean, there is actually quite a lot of guidance now available to local authorities and other bodies looking at assessments of effective interventions to reduce air pollution. Um, 
uh, I was a member of the uh, Public Advisory, Public Health Advisory Committee for NICE, which developed their guidelines. And they looked at the literature in relation to interventions, and they did uh, economic analysis as well. And they came out with a, a reasonably thorough report uh, analysing potential interventions. Uh, and greening of cities was one of the areas they looked at. Again, the evidence for that is somewhat equivocal, and it very much, again, depends on, on the nature of the situation they're put into. So quite a lot of work has been done, um, uh, and I think what we are doing is trying to make sure that people are aware of this evidence uh, and can access it. Um, but I think local authorities are aware of this as well, and that's why, for example, in Glasgow, it's, they're not just having the low emission zone, but they're having the Avenues project, which is effectively, and you'll know more about it than I do, you know, there is an attempt to recreate the, the, the street landscape and to improve greening uh, in relation to it, but to totally transform the kind of street pattern. Um, and I think progressively that's the kind of thing which will make a difference um, in terms of encouraging people to get out of their cars and make use of uh, uh, alternative means of transport. So I think there is quite a lot of evidence about that already, and I think local authorities should be aware of that. But certainly one of the things we are hoping to do is, is, is produce a briefing later in the year, um, which will highlight all these sources of evidence so that if people are not aware of them, they can access them more readily. Uh, Sally Hall. Um, there are two points, I think. One of the things that struck me in, in the previous conversation was the complexity of all these different components coming together. And I, I really was th thinking in my own mind as to whether a systems analysis has actually been conducted to look at how these different elements relate, because I think that is a very useful tool for bringing together all the different interventions or different approaches that are being taken. Um, the second uh, thought I had was in relation to uh, effective interventions. The effective interventions may work differently in different areas depending on the nature of, of, of the situation. <coughs> and in a sense, in addition to effective interventions, I think there's a need for an, a, a system of option appraisal that allows areas to make judgments about what would be the best way to take the intervention for, forward. And these really are systems that are used in academic research for working out how to take things forward. Yeah, fair point. Uh, David Newby. Yeah, it was just to just to answer Sandra's question about um, living and um, uh, the associations with with uh, illness. So certainly there is a canyon effect that you can have, and of course uh, Glasgow and Edinburgh has lots of lovely tenement flats, which does tend to uh, exacerbate the situation. And if you look at people with cardiovascular disease, the closer they live to a road, the more cardiovascular disease they have. So there is a clear relationship. Uh, almost dose dependent in distance and that of course plays to social deprivation and, 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 and deprived areas that tend to only be able to afford housing in areas that are very polluted and close to roads and things so these things are all uh, interlinked absolutely um, there are I, I, I and I, I can't really speak to how town and country planning could be improved we've inherited these things but you know radical solutions like making people park their car on the periphery of the city and having transport into the city might encourage them to disengage from being completely wedded to their car uh, when they get in their car to go 50 yards down the road to go to the shop i mean it's just crackers and and i think that you know that is part of the answer but not easy to deliver i accept um, and thank you, Camino. I wanted to follow on from Sandra White's question there, um, specifically around how um, health boards and local authorities can lead by example. And two years ago, I asked the government about what they were doing to help encourage the fitting of filters, for example. And the response I had was that the Scottish government do provide an air quality grant scheme to support retrofitting of vehicles. But the take-up of that has been incredibly low. So in terms of these sorts of um, interventions, uh, what does the panel feel should be done in, in that sort of case? Should um, the retrofitting of these vehicles be compulsory? You know, to actually have a, um, from the work we're doing now, to actually look towards what we can do now to try to tackle this? Yes, please. Uh, certainly, <coughs> we did research at uh, um, uh, University showing that retrofitting particle traps does have a benefit in terms of preventing some of the adverse health effects of air pollution. And um, if it's voluntary, then it doesn't happen. Um, and grant schemes are helpful, but don't. Uh, and so, you know, that legislative angle is important. One thing that people have used as arguments against it is it does make the engine less efficient, so it produces more hothouse gases, etc. Um, but ultimately, these engines are generally more efficient anyway. 
Uh, so it's a, it's a trade-off. I think some health authorities, I mean, you know, from speaking for mine, I do frustrated uh, sometimes. Uh, there are psychopaths to um, the Royal Infirmary, which I'll be taking on my way back. Um, but the new site, lots of new buildings. How many electrical charge points are there? Zero. Uh, the Western General Hospital has two. And I struggle to get my car if I do ever drive my car, as I did the weekend because I had to go to St John's afterwards to get it to be charged because everyone's parked around it not using it. So I think there are things that can be done more imaginatively and better in health authorities to lead by example. Thank you very much. Now can I ask Alison Johnson to open the next section? Of the yes, um, thank you, convener. I probably would like to have a bit of a focus on the comments from the British Lung Foundation and chest, heart and stroke around CAFs, cleaner air for Scotland. Um, and I, I think certainly Chest Heart and Stroke Association, you're suggesting that we need to be treating this as a national emergency. You know, we really have got to grips and treat passive smoking very seriously, but we seem a lot more relaxed about air pollution, um, despite the number of, even if it's not killing you, it's certainly not doing you any good and it's, it's actually costing us all a fortune. Um, I would ask Professor Newby, please don't temper your anger. Um, <laughs> I, I think we really need to, to develop a sense of urgency here, but, you know, CAFs, for example, is it's looking to deliver what is it, 10% of all journeys by, by, by 2020? Well, here we are in 2018, we're probably sitting about 2%. Um, you know, the proportion, in, in my view, of the transport budget that's spent on active travel is simply not fit for purpose. So I'd just like to hear what you think we might do to, to make this, you know, just to encourage the parliament, the government, to take this issue more seriously. And I think there's a couple of things for, for me around that that... In other areas where we, we look at things like tobacco, or for, for example, alcohol, we have a product. We have something that we can visualise when you talk about it. So, you know, if we talk about um, cigarette smoking, we, we know what that is. And we know when we say drinking, you might all uh, have a different vision in your minds of what a drink might be. It might be a cocktail, it might be a pint. But we know what we're talking about in terms of those issues. I think when we come to clean air, you know, you can't, you can't get a handle on it. The scientists will tell me, you know, why that is. Um, but, you know, there's an element of it's something that's there around us, but we can't, you can't label it. You can't sort of market it in a way uh, that you can other types of things that impact on your health. And so I think that's why there's sometimes not a sense of urgency about it um, as a result of that. It's not something that you can take away or, or give to someone um, in that sense. So I think there's something around changing the culture and the, the narrative around um, clean air and, and sort of seeing it as something where, you know, and I, I mentioned it earlier, and I, I talked to people who, who have chest conditions about this, that breathing is an activity that we're all doing right now. And sort of bringing it right back into that moment of, you know, we're breathing air in and out right now. And if that's affecting you, if you're in Lockie and Dundee, I've got a huge amount of affection for Dundee. I used to live near Lockie, very aware of the issues there. You know, that's something that you're living with and it's affecting your health. Um, I think there's definitely something around um, decision making for me to make it urgent. So um, I, in terms of reflecting on what Jenny was talking about, about decisions that are being made, and going back to something that David Stewart said about the, the difficulty sometimes of being a politician and picking that moment when public opinion is going with you, I think there's really something that the parliament and government can do to start to generate that um, and to support um, the third sector to be bold in that as well. I mean, it's, 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 it's also sort of a little bit frightening for us to take that step forward and say we think this is a national emergency, we think this is a high priority, when we know there are so many other priorities that people are facing and that politicians are facing in terms of decisions. But in terms of Scotland's health, we know that if we don't change things now, then you know, the research that's coming through about decisions that were made 30 years ago and their impact on Scotland's health around housing, around poverty, um, around employment, they're coming home to roost. Um, so there's definitely something around we can see that trajectory and if we don't take that action now, then where will we be um, in 30 years' time? We know that the NHS is under strain um, uh, and, and we can't get away from that fact. Uh, but the way to resolve that is, isn't to keep sending people there to, to be treated for conditions they developed as a result of things like air pollution. We, we have to bring that, that spend um, forward. Um, when we talk about sort of upstream investment, and I think the main challenge around upstream investment is that we are not set up to do it. The systems, the financial systems, the funding systems are currently not there to enable us to do that. One of the examples I've used recently is that as a charity, if I was really sort of taking the messaging around preventative spend, I would take it out of all of the services that we deliver as a charity and only work on prevention at that upstream position. Now, if I was going to do that as a charity, I can only imagine what my stakeholders would say. 
um, and my service users would say. So I understand the boldness that comes around that decision making, but we have to get to a stage where that's where the conversation is, is at. And part of that is my work and Claire's work, but part of it is also Claire's point that actually a lot of the time people just don't have access to the right information options appraisal to say if we close this and open that or if we move this here or there, how is that integrating? And it goes back to Sally's point about a systems analysis and actually understanding the system that we're in. That's really complex, but I also think it's attainable um, if we're ambitious about it. Thank you. Uh, Claire? Yeah, I, I think the absolutely back up your points around active travel. I think there needs to be a lot more done on that. And I, I just keep coming back to the point about communications and awareness and education. I mean, the British Lung Foundation, we're a, a small charity in, in Scotland. We're doing what we can in terms of raising awareness, but we just don't have the, the resources or the clout, admittedly. And we work as well as, good, as, well as we can with other third sector organisations. That's why we set up the cross-party group for lung health with Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland. That's why we try to get things out into the press. That's why we've been going to the sort of comm subgroup um, uh, for CAFs to try and say, what are you going to do about National Clean Air Day? What campaigns are you going to do? We'd love to help you with this. Because I think the Scottish Government has done some brilliant awareness campaigns. And then until we really, like you said, bring the public along with you, let people know, do you know, if you live in a severely polluted area, your child is five times more likely to develop a lung condition? Or do you know that if you live in a deprived area, you're already two and a half times more likely to have a lung condition, and there you're probably going to end up in hospital? Or using the, the real life examples, the people that we know are supporters you know uh, we have people saying that they 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 just don't come to the cities anymore or someone wants to come visit her daughter in edinburgh but that'll knock her off her feet for maybe five days afterwards because of the impact that that has she might not end up in hospital that time but she over the course of her daily visit it, it'll get worse and worse and then she'll be wiped out for the next week i mean these are these are the real life impacts and these are the stories that we want to get out there and i think it's really important to get out there to make it real for people and if we could get some sort of funding and some real boost behind a public health campaign on this it would be really really valuable yes. can you be at the question um i think i came to visit you in the royal infirmary it feels like a couple of years ago maybe two or three years ago now with um ian murray mp deirdre brock um yes. and we you know, we experienced your research at first hand and I was really struck by the fact that you said you were quite likely to have been sitting in heavy traffic in the hours before you have a major heart incident. Um, do you feel that evidence has been accepted and that we're acting on it? Yeah, I think that there is a lack of visibility of it sometimes. Um, obviously, uh, not to take anything away from the, the lung issues that are going on with air pollution, people can readily visualise that it's lung issue. Um, but actually... The, the, the biggest mortality risk of air pollution is, is heart disease and strokes. So actually it's cardiovascular consequences that are killing the people uh, from air pollution and that's the main driver of the attributable uh, deaths uh, uh, for air pollution. So I think there is a, a visibility issue. Um, the BHF have funded a lot of my work to, to look at this and investigate it and we've demonstrated that if you breathe in particles, they can indeed get even get into your bloodstream and, and cause problems with, with uh, uh, heart disease and strokes. So I think there is a visibility issue that people just think about lungs and asthma, uh, which is not to detract anything from that. It's very important, but it's also that it's far more, more far reaching than that. And that is something that people, I think, don't acknowledge. Thank you very much. Uh, Miranda. To what Dave said, the other thing is, um, you know, there's a lot of research now that shows it's likely air pollution exposures, you know, when your mother is pregnant or when you are um, a child can have an impact that doesn't show up to later life. So we don't necessarily know later on what's going to happen. Um, so it's important to be preventative now. Uh, but the other thing that I, I find in my work um, that has been brought up is you know, it's because air pollution is very difficult to get people to really be enthusiastic about, partly because if, unless you're a vulnerable person who firsthand feels the effects, such as an asthmatic, you know, people may not think it applies to them. Um, and there's also competing priorities. So people may be concerned about other things. So um, this isn't really my area of expertise, but we really need to maybe understand what are the motivations for people to either change their their perceptions of air pollution as as, um, as a risk, or how you know can we look at the larger picture, like Sally said, um, and really try to address it, perhaps through somewhat more more indirect means. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Sally Hall and then Olivia. Yeah. Um, making air pollution meaningful, I think, is really problematic because, as you, as you said, if you're asymptomatic, if you, then it's actually very difficult to understand it has an impact. When we were looking at how people reduce smoking in the home, one of the biggest and most effective way of dealing with that for people who smoke is actually to monitor the PM 2.5 and then actually show them the graph trace of the differing levels. And I think that was also instrumental in monitoring in bars, was also instrumental from an advocacy point of view of promoting the danger. Actually seeing a visual representation of air pollution levels, feedback can be extremely effective. And I, I'm not sure whether that's ever been used in relation to air pollution specifically. Olivia. I think to add on to what Sally just said, uh, uh, what's really important is risk assessment. And generally, people are really poor at figuring out how at risk they are of something, to something. And, and with smoking, I think the public health campaigns, as Claire was mentioning, the importance of them, have been quite successful at, at helping people to measure risk and to figure out exactly what risk is posed to them by continuing to smoke. And if we could get campaigns to be a lot, to demonstrate that more clearly to the public, then I think that would sort of address um, David Stewart's um, issue of getting the public on side when you're trying to make uh, pollution related changes because if they knew how it impacted their health a lot more better than a lot better then they'd they'd be a lot more um, involved in pushing for change thank you very much and for the last line of question Ashtana. thank you convener um, when I was reading through the written submissions um, I was particularly surprised by something that Claire Shaw has mentioned um, a few questions ago which is about that the level of pollution is much higher inside cars than, than outside cars, which as a driver myself, I was quite surprised by that. And I don't know if I'm unusual that I didn't know that or whether that's a sort of a commonly held misconception by drivers. You know, you look at cyclists outside the car and you think, oh, they must be breathing in the fumes from the cars going by when actually you're sitting breathing in the fumes in your own vehicle. So I suppose if we're talking about this issue and we're talking about transport and particularly drivers contributing quite a lot to the pollution levels and we want to create a, a behavioral change, um, in your the submission, you said that you thought this might be a potential area for a, a national um, campaign by the Scottish Government. And obviously they've had some really successful ones before, like the Take It Out Right Outside campaign, which was a good example of that. So if we're talking about public health, you know, pollution, trying to change behaviour and preventative spending, if we link all those things together, I'm just wondering if the panel think that a public health campaign on this particular issue um, which might get drivers out of their cars onto public transport or maybe active travel or even electric vehicles is the place where you would spend the money. If you, you, know, if you can't spend the money on everything, where, would you think that would be a good place to, to spend that money? I, yes, is the short answer. I, I do think there is real um, benefit in making sure a public health campaign is properly resourced. Um, but I'm very conscious to add that this isn't just all about telling people to make changes themselves and then not giving them the tools to do so. It has to be backed up by, you know, greater investment in active travel. It has to be backed up by making sure that people can switch to low emission vehicles. It has to be backed up by, you know, a, a targeted diesel scrappage scheme to allow the people who are most affected to, to get cleaner vehicles. It can't be just about making people, telling them that it's your responsibility entirely to make change. Um, but and as, and as long as a campaign is backed up by these other policies and making sure that the policies and CAFs are actually enacted, then I do think there's real benefit in putting a lot more resource into public health awareness. Thank you very much. Uh, Miranda Lowe. I just want to comment on the cars aspect. Um, while it is possible that your exposure inside the car can be higher, it's not always the case. So I think there's been studies and they find various um, results. But I think it is possible that you do have higher exposures inside uh, a vehicle, such as a bus or a car, in heavy traffic. Um, but there have also, in some studies, they do find that depending on how you set um, circulation in the car, it can have an impact as well. Um, but I would, do want to bring out this idea of people understanding their own exposure. While I also agree that it's, you, you know, you never want to rely on people changing their behaviors you want so that the whole system to change. But um, that may help, you know, raise awareness um, about, because then they might be able to see that it impacts themselves um, as well. And certainly um, some of the studies that, you know, I've done in the past, we have participants and we, we you know, they, we monitor them for various 
environmental exposures and you know we feed back that information for them and also provide information about what this means and I think that that can be very on an individual level that can be very useful um, but again you know we are looking at a population level change as well that needs to be addressed thank you very much uh, Sandra just a, a very small one to pick up on the point Miranda uh, mentioned, uh, obviously in the car, but you also mentioned about people travelling in buses and public transport. And I seem to recollect there was a, a report where you can actually, you know, breathe in these fumes, you know, at a greater level sitting on a bus than you can even walking in traffic. Is that correct? I just wondered, that, you know, because I think that's something that really we need to look at as well. Yeah. So again, I think there have been studies that have shown that. So I want to bring out that you know these are these are not these don't necessarily apply universally to all buses, but there are situations where it's found that the you know kind of part of it's self pollution and also infiltration from just traffic around you um, can increase the the, um, the levels inside. I mean, I think this goes to the idea that when you're inside, and I think. Olivia might have mentioned this before, you're not necessarily protected from air pollution either. Um, so, you know, what's inside depends on many things, um, such as, you know, whether it's likely that you've got the windows open or whether you have a more of a drafty house. You can still get pollution from outdoors inside. And, of course, there are also sources of pollution inside um, as well, which, you know, we, we can't so easily regulate, I would say. Thank you very much. Emma Harper. Pick up on that point, actually. I mean, we're talking about transport being the biggest contributor to air pollution, but there are other sources that are emerging, like wood burning stoves, and then agricultural emissions are also something to consider. Um, I know there's issues of increased COPD from fish processing and also folk working in sawmills, maybe. But I guess our main focus should be transportation because that is the biggest issue that we face that affects. Um, you know, our lung health, is that what we should be doing? Focus on transport? Can, can, I, can I widen that question, um, taking Emma's question and, and ask you to answer that, but also uh, as we're approaching the end of the evidence session, uh, if there's any, if there's any, this is a session on preventive health interventions. We've covered uh, some areas in considerable depth, others less so. If there's any one thing that hasn't been raised yet that you think is important uh, in terms of prevention in this field, please let us know now. Who would like to answer Emma's question with that wider supplementary? Claire. Uh, I'll admit, I'll admit uh, my knowledge on the wood burning stoves isn't as much as it is on transport emissions. I know that is um, an, in an increasing area of concern. I mean, if you look collectively at industrial, commercial, residential emissions, they are the, the biggest contributor. Um, but if, like I said before, if we look at transport, then you're tackling other public health issues. And uh, as Professor Newby said, the worst pollution tends to be in and our urban centres and related to transport, and that's where it's highest, and that's also where you get people who tend to be also already unwell. So I think that's where we should prioritise first. Um, and in terms of preventative uh, spend generally, um, as an organisation, we are very keen that preventative spend increases, um, and we think we need to move away from this acute agenda and just managing disease, um, because with in terms of lung conditions, I mean, we're just going to get more and more people living with chronic lung conditions and comorbidities and, and chronic heart conditions. Um, and it's best that we try and stop that in the first instance, because if we just manage and manage and manage, it's a huge, it's a huge cost. I mean, last year there was 100,000 hospital admissions because of respiratory conditions due to respiratory. Um, and it's the second highest emergency admission. And if we do a lot more in terms of looking at things like pulmonary rehabilitation, self-management programs, things that mean that people can self-manage their condition and preventative spend that stops them getting these things in the first place, huge savings down the line. Thank you very much. Would anyone else like to answer Emma's question? Then we'll come back to... Uh, uh, yes, uh, Miranda and then Colin. <laughs> so I'll just say um, definitely transport's a very, very important contributor to air quality. Um, I don't know for Scotland necessarily what the contribution of, of wood burning is, but certainly you know, it's not necessarily something people need to do it, but it is contributing to air pollution. And the other thing is often in winter, the air pollution tends to be worse just because of meteorological conditions. So, and that's when a lot of wood burning tends to happen. So 
I mean, I think it's important not to focus only on transportation because there are still other sources. But certainly transportation is very widespread and it does impact just about everybody because we all walk on the road, we all, you know, well, some of us drive cars, I don't. But, you know, we, we are all definitely impacted by that. Um, but I also do want to say that, you know, we should not only focus on transportation, certainly. Um, if you got rid of, as we've said before, you can't reduce all the pollution from transportation completely, but you can also tackle other sources as well. It's Colin Ramsey. Yeah, and I think the consensus is that transport and vehicle transport, combustion engine transport, is the thing that should be focused on in terms of preventable air pollution. Um, I mean, I think there are other sources of air pollution, but I think by and large they have been uh, reduced um, partly by accident, partly because of our uh, deindustrialization um, to be a, uh, to a significant degree, but also just changing patterns in, in terms of industry and all the rest of it. Um, as far as the wood burning stoves are concerned, I mean, I think it's not at the moment an enormous problem, but I think anecdotally there are plenty of people who've suffered the consequences of their neighbours deciding to uh, invest in a wood burning stove and haven't necessarily uh, adopted the appropriate um, uh, techniques in terms of controlling the pollution. I think there has been evidence from London, and I mentioned this at the Environment Committee when they were looking at this issue, um, that particulate pollution levels have been starting to creep up, uh, and it's particularly a phenomenon at weekends when the wood-burning stoves are being used excessively. Um, so I think it's a phenomenon that we, which people are aware of and are concerned about, and um, certainly in environmental health departments are aware of this in, in local circumstances. But I think perhaps the bigger issue is about biomass and the use of biomass more generally and incentives that have been created to encourage biomass burning, sometimes as an alternative to um, uh, cleaner uh, carbon-based fuels like gas, and you can argue the case for that whether it's desirable or not. But I think we, we can't afford to be complacent about uh, the, the, the unintended consequences of trying to be greener in some circumstances um, and have to be well aware of that. So we don't want to improve it in one area and then end up um, uh, having problems created by attempts to remedy the situation. Uh, so I think that's worth noting. Indeed. Thank you very much. And there was one final supplementary from David Stewart. Yeah, just a general point, uh, convener, on uh, low emission zones. I know we're in some questions on that later, but just make a general point that I, I think across the world there's been great examples of LEZs, and where it's worked well is where we've had uh, Euro 6 buses. Buses are adapted to be lower emitting, and we've had adequate fares. My, sl my only slight concern from taking evidence in a previous committee is that you end up finding non-LEZs areas may well get more of the polluting buses. Uh, and because bus companies have to invest highly, there's a danger that fares may go up. So I would just put one caution, you need to get the timing of LEZ right, because that's certainly been the evidence in other parts of Europe. Thank you very much. Any response to that or, or comments on that? I think, I think the LEZs point is a, is a fair one and, and, and a good one on which to end. There are initiatives and we had also the question of burning biomass. There are initiatives taken in this area which may have unintended consequences, and I think that's one of the things that's become clear from the evidence session. But can I thank all our witnesses very much indeed uh, for the, this morning's evidence. It's been extremely helpful, and we will take a break now and then go uh, proceed with the agenda thereafter. Thank you very much.
In just a moment. Thank you very much. Uh, and we move on now to agenda item two, which is consideration of an affirmative instrument. As usual with these instruments, we will have an evidence session uh, with the Cabinet Secretary and our officials uh, on the instrument. Uh, and once we have uh, had uh, questions on the instrument, we will move to the formal debate in the motion. The instrument in question is the Alcohol Minimum Price Per Unit Scotland Order 2018 in draft. And I welcome uh, once again the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sports, Shona Robison, uh, accompanied by Daniel Kleinberg, the Head of Health Improvement, uh, Louise Feeney, uh, Alcohol Policy Team Leader, uh, Marjorie Marshall, Economic Advisor, and Lindsay Anderson, Solicitor, also from the Scottish Government. Can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a, a brief opening statement? Thank you very much, Convener, and I'm delighted to join you this morning to consider Scotland's first minimum unit price for alcohol. Last November, the UK Supreme Court concluded minimum unit pricing was targeted, proportionate and lawful. This unanimous judgment fully endorsed Scotland's alcohol pricing policy. My statement to Parliament then set out our plans for consultation and engagement. As you know, I propose a minimum unit price of 50 pence per unit of alcohol from the 1st of May 2018. We ran a public consultation on 50 pence across December and January. We received 130 consultation responses. Of those who commented on the 50 pence proposal, 74% supported 50 pence. The consultation process did not bring to light any new relevant evidence. Taking account of a number of factors, we concluded a minimum price of 50 pence per unit strikes a balance between public health and social benefits and intervention in the market. We've engaged extensively with the alcohol industry since November, and our approach has been welcomed by trade bodies and businesses alike. We've produced comprehensive government guidance for industry and funded two bespoke products, the Scottish Grocers Federation booklet for smaller retailers and the Scottish Wholesale Association guidance for wholesalers. We've worked with licensing standards officers and provided a range of communications materials for retailers and alcohol and drug partnerships. Scotland, Scottish Minister's decision to propose a minimum unit price of 50 pence per unit is supported by an updated business and regulatory impact assessment, the BRIA, which I've laid before Parliament. Members will see from the BRIA that 51% of all off-trade sales in 2016 were below a minimum price of 50 pence. This indicates a sizable portion of the alcohol market will be impacted at the level of 50 pence. The BRIA also details outputs from the University of Sheffield modelling. In 2016, Sheffield estimated that 50 pence per unit would lead to 58 fewer alcohol-related deaths in the first year, with a cumulative total of 392 fewer alcohol-related deaths within five years. The reduction in alcohol-related hospital admissions will be similarly substantial. While I remain open-minded about future consideration of the rate, our collective priority right now must be to implement the policy without further delay. I need not detail the extensive uh, costs of alcohol to our health, our economy and our society. However, let me just remind you that as a nation we drink 40% more than the low-risk drinking guidelines of 14 units per week for men and women. While minimum pricing has been a long time coming, it is not a panacea. It sits within a framework of over 40 measures, a policy we are currently refreshing to ensure it keeps pace with Scotland's relationship with alcohol. Alcohol policy is backed by significant public funding. Since 2008, we've invested over £746 million to tackle problem alcohol and drug use. We're also committed uh, to an additional £20 million per year to frontline alcohol and drug services. Members will know Parliament legislated for a sunset clause on minimum pricing. Scottish ministers will bring to Parliament a report on the impact of the policy five years on. Parliament will then vote on the policy's continuation before the sixth year of operation. NHS Health Scotland is conducting an independent evaluation and industry are involved in those studies looking at the policy's economic impact. I'm sure this committee will take a keen interest in the evaluation, keeping track of emerging findings in the coming months and years. With Parliament's support, I look forward to implementing the 50 pence rate on the 1st of May. I hope very much this will come with endorsement from across the Parliament. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary. We'll now move to questions from members. Can I start with uh, Alec Cole-Hamilton? Thank you very much, 
very much, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you for coming to see us today, and thank you to your officials as well. It's now six years since the Act was passed, and obviously implementation has been stalled for reasons we're all very well aware of. Um, but the minimum unit price of 50 pence was agreed at six years ago and has been somewhat overtaken by events in terms of the rise of inflation and, and other factors, other pressures, to the point where it's fair to say, and I think this is echoed by third sector organisations and campaigning groups who say that now that the impact of that has been diminished because of the increased uh, inflation. So um, why, uh, I understand that you want to implement without any further delay, but what consideration has your government given since the Supreme Court judgment to that price of 50? And would you consider lifting it to 60 pence, which is what a number of groups and certainly my party are now advocating? Well, let me say a, a few things about that. I mean, first of all, um, you'll be aware that all of the, the modelling um, done by Sheffield University was based around the 50 pence uh, per, uh, per unit price. Uh, and that's important because, um, it, and I'll go on to say a little bit about the, the complexity of, of changing that price. It's not as simple just to replace one price with another, a whole load of things would flow from that which would be considerable in delaying the implementation of minimum unit pricing. But importantly, the, uh, the court case and the evidence led in court was based on the modelling done by Sheffield University on 50 pence. It's also important to say it's the affordability of alcohol that, that matters, not simply the price. And that's going to depend on other factors such as income growth and how the market reacts to minimum unit price pricing as well as inflation. Um, and I think we have to make sure uh, that we are able to look at the evidence and, of course, the evaluation, the uh, MISAS evaluation, will, be, will give us the fuller picture of all of these matters. And, of course, we want to keep that, the, the price issue under review um, as we take matters forward. But I'm very keen, given the journey we've on, which you outlined in your question, that we don't have uh, any further delay. Let me give you just one example of what that delay would cause. Uh, in 2012, we had to notify uh, the European Commission of, of the 50 pence. If that was to change, we'd have to go back to the Commission with a, a different price. That's a lengthy process. Uh, and, of course, it could open up to further legal challenge based on whether or not there was a challenge about whether a different price was proportionate or not. We won the case based on 50 pence that it was a proportionate uh, price and balanced the, the issue of public health with with uh, the uh, business interests. So uh, it is not as simple just to take one number off and put another number on. A lot of complex issues would flow from that and delay would certainly flow from that. And that's something that really, I think we've had enough delay. We want to get on with the implementation. Thank you, Convener. I, I understand that. And I understand and I share that uh, willingness to press on and, and see this implemented. Um, it, it, you said in your opening remarks that the price will be kept under review. So it, whilst it's complex, it's not impossible. We can change it. What are the staging posts for that review and, and when will we come back to this? Well, clearly we have the five years uh, before the sunset clause, uh, so it could be that uh, depending on what the evidence is that emerges, it's going to take some time for the evidence to emerge. It's not going to happen six months down the line. It's going to take some time before we know the full impact. We know the impact on the, the market, for example. So I, would, I don't want to put a moment in time because that moment in time might not be the right moment in time depending on the evaluation. So I think we should keep these matters under review. There's obviously the formal pause in five years time uh, to look at whether the, the policy will continue given the sunset clause. But I think I would be reluctant to at this moment give a, 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 a point in time. I'm sure though the committee will want to look at the evidence as we go forward. And I would be happy to engage with the committee on the evidence as it emerges, rather, you know, not just necessarily wait for, for the five-year point. Thank you very much. Uh, Sandra White. Thank you very much, Kavina. Uh, I'm fully in support of the minimum uh, pricing. Uh, actually, I, th I think we need a minimum unit pricing, uh, particularly when you mentioned about hospital admissions. Uh, substantial. I mean, I visited the Royal Infirmary and really, you know, 
quite appalled at the amount of people who were lying on trolleys uh, with accidents through over, you know, alcohol, etc. And, and that brings me on to the social responsibility at Levy. Uh, I, I notice that there's no plans at the moment, or there were plans, but there's nothing here in, in this bill which would introduce the social responsibility levy, uh, which obviously... I feel would be substantial help to the health service and local authorities as well as it, as it was meant to be in the in the initial act. I just wonder, are there any plans to introduce the social responsibility levy when you're looking at the five-year or six-year plan? Have we any idea if the social responsibility levy will be introduced? Well, again, as a government, we would always keep whether it's the public health supplement or the social responsibility levy, we'll keep these under review. Um, but let me say a, a couple of things specifically about the social responsibility levy. Remember, it was geared towards recouping local costs associated with uh, with um, uh, with alcohol. So, for example, local costs, additional policing costs. So it was more supposed to be a, a local for to cover local costs rather than than in relation to. To, um, to minimum unit pricing. Also, the um, additional revenue highlighted uh, is a high estimate. Uh, I think we need to see what the evidence shows because if behaviours change and actually people consume less, then really we need to see the evidence. These are guests well, they're estimates, but they're based on what they think might happen, but we don't know until we see the see the market uh, operation. It's also it's revenue, not profit. And I think at the moment, again, we need to see the evidence of where uh, the, 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 those revenues would go. So we don't know whether it would be the retailer, the wholesaler, the producer, or a combination. So who would you put the levy on? So we need to understand all of that, but we should keep it under review. But I think in the light of the evidence, we would be in a better position um, to um, to uh, look at that in in more detail. I think also, um, given the you know we have to take into account the current economic circumstances um, when when you're introducing whether it's a levy or a supplement. Uh, so although we have no plans to do so at the current time, it is something we'll keep under review. We should look at the the evaluation and the evidence as it emerges, and that'll help us to better understand if there are additional revenues from this policy, where do they fall? And then we'll be able to make a more informed decision. Stand up. That was one of the points I wanted to raise. If there was, you know, this additional revenue, would it be the licensee, as you have explained, you're looking into that, who would benefit from it, uh, which obviously was supposed to be part of the, uh, the social uh, responsibility. And the other issue I wanted to raise is, if, well, if you're looking at what effect it has in the five, six years, if you're going to change you know, the minimum pricing units, as uh, Alec uh, Cole Hamilton had mentioned, would it be uh, for this committee or parliament or, or the minister that when you produce um, evidence, then you would we could ask or it could be asked in parliament if now you were going to introduce the social responsibility levy as it goes along through the five, six years? Well, I, I think in the light of all of the evidence that will emerge over the next five years, you know, we'll reflect on all of these matters. We'll reflect on the impact of the policy per se. We'll look at where the, the if if there are additional revenues raised, and I think that's yet to be tested. Um, where do those fall? Uh, and in the light of all of that, I think it would give government the opportunity to consider all of those issues in the round and come to a, an informed uh, conclusion about that. Um, what's important at the moment is, is getting this up and running and getting on with it at the, the, the beginning of May. And that allows us then to look at the real evidence that emerges rather than you know, the, the, the estimates based on, on what we think might happen. We need to actually see what... Uh, behavioural changes there are, what what happens in the market, uh, personal behaviours. So, um, but I, again, happy and keen to to work with the committee as that evidence emerges over time. David Stewart. Uh, committee, can I go back to Alec Cohamilton's point um, to look at how uh, MEP is going to be uprated? We've talked about the five-year review, and I understand that. Uh, but during the passage of the bill, Cabinet Secretary, you talked about this and said that it is possible you could have an inflation-linked mechanism such as RPI. And um, there's nothing I can see in the order that adjusts for inflation. If we have 3% inflation, for example, for the next five years, that's going to badly erode uh, the, the whole figure that we currently have. Are you considering an inflation index 
And if it is, will you consider one that's obviously in the current thinking, which is more CPI or CPIX, because RPI, as you know, isn't, isn't one the Bank of England recommend anymore? Well, I mean, I think... I well, as I said earlier, it's the affordability of alcohol that matters, not simply the price. And that's going to depend on factors um, such as income growth, the how the market reacts in, in reality, as well as inflation. So it's not just about inflation, there are all these other factors as well. Um, so I don't think it would be prudent to commit to reviewing in line with a single economic measure. As I've said, we'll keep the rate under review along with the emerging evidence from the extensive evaluation programme. And I think that will help us to answer what, what the next step would be, and rather than just fixing on, on one economic measure. Clarification, Cabinet Secretary, is there any uh, mechanism within the uh, instrument to allow any change to the figure uh, before a five-year review? Uh, I think what you would do is bring forward a further instrument setting a different price, so it's not within the instrument, but that's that's available. And, and obviously, as the evidence develops, if and the evidence were to take you to a different okay. place... That's useful. Because yeah, obviously, the other way of doing it is to have... Um, and I know it's not just about inflation, Cabinet Secretary, but just for argument's sake, you could have had an inflation indicator uh, within the instrument which would allow an annual upgrading. I, I, I take your point. I think, though, we... And that is something, I think, in the light of the evidence as it emerges, we'll be able to see whether or not, as the policy develops into the future, um, whether that's something to be revisited. But I think at the moment we really need to see how this actually works in the in the market and what that tells us about uh, any future price and, and how we would uh, come to an informed decision on that. And if it's um, within the period we're still subject to EU regulations, um, would you require, if there's any change, uh, a commission permission for that? Yeah, so... Um, Louise might want to say a little bit more about that, but yes, because we notified the Commission way back in 2012, I believe it or not, so it was quite a while ago, um, about the, 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 the price. If there was a change in price, we would require uh, the Commission to be notified again. There is a quite a lengthy process around that, so, um, and that's one aspect. I think the other would be, you know, there is the... Uh, which, again, is why it's important for the evidence of, of the, the policy impacting, you know, that there, we couldn't rule out a further challenge, uh, I guess, based on what um, um, interests might perceive as being a, a disproportionate response. So we've won the case based on it being a proportionate response. We'd have to be quite mindful if there was a price change in the future about making sure that test was still met. Otherwise, I think we could open ourselves up to a, a different line of, of challenge. Shall we, do you want to do no, nothing to add? No. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Brian Whittle. You know, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Actually, if I, if, I, if I may, I just wanted to raise a point that uh, it was raised with me in the, uh, an addiction treatment centre recently uh, around those who behavioural change is more of a challenge uh, and the impact that um, minimum unit pricing will have on them and, and potentially the, their families. And I wonder with that in mind, is the cognizance the, the, the Scottish Government have given to supporting uh, uh, those with that, that, that additional challenge and, and uh, the supporting of, uh, the, sort of the addiction treatment centres? Is that part of the, the, the strategy? Yes. Um, May Daniel say a little bit more about this? Yes, it is, and um, what the aim would be to make sure that um, people are given the opportunity, and given I think all the publicity around this, it's also uh, an opportunity in itself to have that discussion uh, with uh, uh, people who are using um, alcohol at harmful levels or indeed have an addiction. That uh, this is a, a good opportunity to to seek and receive services and support. Um, it obviously has always been a policy that targets hazardous and, and harmful uh, drinkers, and we know uh, that those that drink most heavily and, and live in deprived areas experience uh, the greatest levels of harm. So we've always argued they're going to benefit most from the, the policy. And we know, of course, that in areas of deprivation, rates of alcohol-related uh, deaths are six times that of least deprived areas. So there is a, um, a an opportunity to, from a health inequality perspective, to have a big impact here. Uh, but for those with a, an, an addiction um, 
Daniel, I don't know if you want to say a little bit more. There will, there has been a, a focus. We've been talking to ADPs about the support that can be given. Do you want to say uh, a little? That, that's exactly the point I was going to make. Is we've spoken to alcohol and drug partnerships to allow them to prepare for just being aware of the fact that as minimum price comes in, it's an innovative measure, so things may may land differently. Um, um, so um, that, that's been a piece of work we've had underway. Drinkers, so yeah. Um, and the investment in services, of course, to support people who are probably, by the time they're drinking the cheapest alcohol, already drinking at levels which require attention. I think we're all sort of, um, right in thinking that we're providing uh, materials to ADPs to distribute locally and signposting to local services that can help people whose drinking is problematic. So there has been a bit of thought uh, put to this with an opportunity to try and signpost people to services. Just to um, thank you for that comment, Sega. Just to uh, add the point: are, are we looking at supporting the, the, those third sector organisations who are also uh, involved in the treatment of uh, addiction as well? Because the, the, the it will fall upon them, uh, I imagine, some of this burden. Yes, and I mean a, a lot of the the support to third sector organisations that provide uh, support to, on the, the front line is is done through the. ADP uh, structures and um, so so yes through the um, the the usual mechanisms and resources that are around those systems uh, at the moment and of course there is the additional twenty million pounds uh, as well which um, again a lot of third sector organisations I'm sure will, will benefit from that. Miles Briggs. Thank you, Convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, the Cabinet Secretary, in your statement, um, touched upon this work um, with the FSB Scotland and also with the Scottish um, Wholesale Trade Association. But I just wondered, in terms of um, the policy and now what is quite a, a tight time, time scale to implement it, um, what ongoing consultation and work is the government undertaking with these organisations? Yeah, I mean, there's been extensive uh, in making sure so, for example, that we would support them with materials that explain it to them and their members clearly uh, about minimum unit pricing, how it works, but also that they'll be able to communicate with the, the public about how it works. So, um, so it's clear this is a government policy and they're able to, to signpost anyone who wants to uh, uh, make further inquiries uh, to, to the government on that. So a lot of work has gone on around uh, the development of those materials so that um, you know, come the implementation of the policy when it hits the ground running, that you know there's been that awareness raising. Daniel, do you want to? Yeah, well, do you want to, to the work. Raise? Yeah, I mean, we, we've been engaging quite extensively with businesses individually and with their trade bodies um, since the Supreme Court judgment in November, and made available, as the Cabinet Secretary says, quite a lot of physical materials as well as guidance and support on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, and our sense is that has been welcomed, and that the vast majority of businesses are ready for implementation on the 1st of May, but more importantly, have resources within their toolkit that they can use to deal with customers who might have questions or concerns about how the policy will impact on them. Okay. And I think a final supplementary question yeah, from Alec Cohan. Uh, thank you very much. And this comes in off the back of Miles Briggs. Uh, question. I've also been in discussion with the Scottish Wholesale Association about this and there's a, a small technical wrinkle here that I understand that there are some um, members of that, that wholesalers uh, organisations or, or companies who um, also have a premises licence or have, are operating with a premises licence so it creates a, a bit of a loophole for them or a problem for them that they might need either dual pricing or to have separate aspects to their building. Is the government offering a workaround for that? Yeah, well, and we're certainly working on that. Daniel, do you want yeah. to... So it's, it is, it's a very technical issue to do with, I think, the operation of the 2005 Act, and we're aware that there's different interpretations. So we're clear there's nothing about MUP in itself that need to apply to trade-only sales, but the way they hold the licence can, can have um, a potential read across. So we're talking to them at the moment. We're happy to consider just further where that leaves them, whether or not they need to adjust their business or what steps we, we can do um, with them to, to help resolve any uncertainty. Thank you. Thank you very much. There being no further questions from members, we will now move to agenda item three on our agenda, uh, which is the formal debate on the affirmative instrument on which we have just taken evidence. <coughs> members will uh, recall that in this process there are no longer opportunities either to ask questions of the Minister uh, or to ask questions of officials, uh, but we do start uh, with the Cabinet Secretary and we invite the Cabinet Secretary uh, to move motion S5M 11141. Uh, formally moved. 
Thank you very much. Can I invite members uh, to contribute to the debate who wish to do so? There being no contributions, I would invite the Cabinet Secretary to add any final comments you may wish on no the final basis comments. Of, thank you very much. That is uh, much appreciated. Are we all agreed uh, to this instrument? Agreed. We are all agreed. Thank you very much, and thank you to the Cabinet Secretary and her officials. Uh, we will now move into private session. <laughs>